Hello everyone and welcome to Artists in Conversation, brought to you by the Brandywine Workshop and Archives. I'm your host, Patty Smith. For those of you who may not be familiar with Brandywine Workshop and Archives, here's a little background. BWA has been a vital, diversity-driven, nonprofit cultural institution for 50 years. It is located in Philadelphia. Its mission is to produce and share art in order to inspire and build bridges among global communities. BWA has several ongoing programs. It funds short-term residencies for artists to produce limited edition original prints. It works to bring the art of diverse cultures to institutions and communities through exhibitions and by establishing satellite collections across the country. BWA offers internships to Philadelphia high school and undergraduate college students who are majoring in art or a related field. And its latest project called Artura is a free interactive digital archive of culturally diverse art that gives educators and students access to information and images representing contemporary cultures and traditions from around the globe. You can access this unique website by registering at artura.org and you can find more information about Brandywine at their website, brandywineworkshopandarchives.org. Our guest today is Lewis Tanner Moore, writer and collector. We will be speaking with him about his longtime friend artist Paul Keane, who passed away in 2009 at the age of 89. Paul Farwell Keane Jr. was a Philadelphia area artist and teacher whose work helped raise the visibility of black American artists. As a self-described abstract realist, his story reflects both the accomplishments and the difficulties of African American artists in the 20th century. Paul Keane Jr. was a Philadelphia born painter and printmaker, sculptor and muralist. He graduated from Central High School. Early in his career, he participated in the Depression Relief Program, WAPA art projects. During World War II, he enlisted in the Air Force and attained the rank of Lieutenant, serving with the Tuskegee Airmen in the 332 Fighter Group. He studied at the Philadelphia Museum School of Industrial Arts, now the University of the Arts, and then went on to earn a BFA, BS, and MFA from Tyler School of Art, Temple University. He also studied at the Académie Julien in Paris, in France from 1949 to 1951, and was awarded a Whitney Fellowship to work in Port-au-Prince, Haiti, from 1952 to 1954. Keane's work can be found around the world in institutions including the Philadelphia Museum of Art, the African American Museum in Philadelphia, the Woodmere Museum, the Mishner Museum, the British Museum, and the Nigerian National Museum. After teaching at the Philadelphia College of Art, again now the University of Arts, Keane went on to establish the art department at Bucks County Community College in Newtown, PA where he retired in 1985 as a professor emeritus. He lived and practiced his art in Warrington, Pennsylvania until his death in 2009. The estate of Paul Keane is donating two works shown here for the October auction fundraiser for the Brandywine Workshop and Archives. And Brandywine is grateful for the family's generosity. Our guest today is Lewis Tanner Moore. Moore worked in the field of public health and human services for more than 25 years. He primarily focused his energies on developing programs and services that respond to the challenges growing out of the HIV AIDS epidemic. Prior to his retirement, he served as the program administrator for the AIDS Activities Coordinating Office of the Philadelphia Department of Public Health. As a counterpoint to that world of public health, Mr. Moore has pursued a long-standing interest in the work of African-American artists. His collection has been featured in a number of exhibitions, and he has written for several articles for the International Review of African-American Art and other publications. His collection includes works by artists such as Calvin Burnett, Barbara Bullock, Bill Hudson, Sid Carpenter, and of course, Paul Keane. Mr. Moore, 
Welcome to Artists in Conversation. Wonderful to be here and happy to be at, a, at an event in support of Brandywine. Uh, something that Paul and I shared was an admiration and respect for the work that Brandywine has done uh, over, over many years. He, he got to it a little before I did, but I certainly share, share that um, sentiment with him. Uh, well, let me begin with this question. How did you get involved in collecting and why? I got involved in collecting for a, a number of reasons. I had the, the great good fortune and well, it was great planning. I, I chose my family very well. I was, was very lucky to, to have been born into a family that valued art, that had art in the home and that happened to be related to it, to an artist, uh, Henry Tanner, who is my great uncle. And along with, with that, and the, if you look at the, the Philadelphia of the, the middle of the last century, um, was a different kind of place. And in many ways, and one of the things that, that uh, it had was the Pyramid Club and my family, my, my dad was one of the founders and other, other people that I knew and was growing up with had been involved in, in that. And so that I, I had access to, to many of the people who showed there uh, early on in life that included uh, Humbert Howard and Laura Waring and later Selma Burke and also Paul Keene who was a little bit younger than the people that were really at the center of the Pyramid Club, but that's where he was the young artist coming into his own. And so that context led me to, to early on have a sense of how significant and important the visual arts were to our culture. And when I got into to school in, in high school, uh, I took a course of the history of art using that great tome that many of us have looked at, the Janssen book that is as bigger than the New York phone book. <laughs> and going through it, I very quickly realized that this encyclopedic book of world art did not include any of the people that I knew of from my growing up, from be it Tanner or Bannister or Huey Lee Smith or on and on that I had been had the opportunity to be exposed to. It didn't include other cultures. It didn't include women. It didn't include, uh, the, there's a whole swath of the culture that was just omitted from that. So that, that really set the stage for me to, to think about art as something more than a representation, but something that allowed us to represent the world to ourselves. And so that, that I guess, led me into looking for art and, and looking to collect. And I remember, yeah, my, my first real involvement with art was uh, in high school putting together a show that was very much intended as a, a counter argument to uh, the prevailing tone of what, what real art was and to express what it could be. And I, as I say, with the access I had put together what I now in retrospect realized was, was a really wonderful little show that uh, included a great Paul Keene painting um, that my sister now owns of the Mardi Gras that is one of his early masterpieces and also a work by Tanner, a work by Laura Waring and a work by a very young then uh, Barclay Hendricks that uh, Humbert Howard introduced me to. So it was, it was a, a joy to, to have worked on and to have had the opportunity. And that sort of was the the kickoff for me feeling that it was something that I wanted to 
be more in, involved and engaged with. And uh, right. so that, that kicked off the, the addiction. Terrific. Can you tell us about your relationship with Paul and how you came to collect his art? Again, some of the things I, I collect are actually, I collected indirectly that my father owned some of his work and I ended up with that. But Paul, a, a lot of people assume that the reason that I got into collecting was because of my relationship to Tanner and having access to some of the other things. But really the person that, that personified art to me as a kid growing up was this friend of, my, of the family who, you know, Paul was, was close with my parents because they had kids about the same age and they could shuffle us off together. And so that Paul was always someone in the, in the circle and I early on had a chance to sort of see him with his beret and his pipe and he was always cool and he was always smooth and he was producing these images that just held the wall. And as I developed my interest, he was very, uh, I wanna say patient in answering all of the stupid questions that you have as you begin down a path. And so that he you know, really nurtured that interest and stood for me very much as a, a sort of model and, and even now looking back even more so I see him as, as a sort of a model of somebody who moved through the 20th century art world. And, uh, you know, having been born in 1920 and in a place where there was virtually no opportunity to, for an African-American to display his work. And that was a time when I think the only gallery that would consider any, that was showing anybody was, was the Carlin Gallery, which showed um, Pippin and Edward Loper from, from Delaware and Paul eventually got in there. And then, it, then there was the Pyramid Club, which was again, a response from the community. And they had exhibitions that were intentionally and deliberately integrated unlike most gallery spaces, but that were featuring the best of African-American artists and were run in initially by Docs Thrash and Humbert Howard. And that was a center for, for that stuff to move forward. And so that's, that was sort of where Paul came into the picture and then he just never left. Uh, if, if you think about his life moving from being a kid who, who attended the settlement house in North Philadelphia, which was a little community center where he was initially just a little kid going there, became interested in art and, and, and excelled at it. Uh, Humbert, or, I'm sorry, Alan Freelon and, and Henry Bozeman Jones, who were, I guess, the two elder statesman artists at the time would come by and do critiques for the young artists. And eventually Paul went on to, as a teenager to begin teaching their, to, you know, teaching the kids programs at the uh, settlement house. And that really was the trajectory that he moved, moved along through his travels and his life. And as, as we talked about a little bit earlier, that, that movement you can trace geographically. And it, it really began with being nurtured as an artist in Philadelphia and in a Philadelphia community that was able to support him. His, you know, his parents were both undertakers and so that they were solidly in, in, a, in a profession and, and able to have the luxury to, to support uh, that kind of an endeavor. 
Great, thank you. Well, Paul Keane has described himself as an intuitive artist. Let's look at a brief clip of him discussing his view of the intuitive artist's approach. This is from an interview he had with docents from the Mishner Museum and was sponsored by the Senior Artists Initiative around 1998 when Paul would have been in his late 70s. The quality of the tape is not so great, but I think you will enjoy hearing his comments about his process. My style is how I, how I see things, how they filter through. My, I paint intuitively and not in such. I, mean, I, I go on intuition. I don't, I can't plot and plan. I, I think an intellectual painter can, can plot and plan. It's all, it, it, it comes out, it's all in my head and it depends upon the color. And then I got a vague idea of what I'm supposed to do. And then I try to do it. If painting or art makes any sense, uh, then it has to come out. And sometimes you wish to come out with much more enthusiasm <laughs> or from or much more excitement than it does. But I have to uh, I'll give me plot. After a certain point, it's putting this together and you just plot and plot and scrape away and plot. It, so you either throw it away, or it leads you to a new idea, so you start a new campus, or you take all of that out but one little place that works, and then you start again. Lewis, there are three places that King felt connected to, Philadelphia, Paris, and Port-au-Prince, Haiti. What can you tell us about his experience in these places and how they influenced his work? Well, I've talked a little bit about Philadelphia, and I think what Philadelphia gave him was a foundation that led him to really up to the level of being a professional artist. And with that foundation, he was able, after the war, to use the GI Bill to, to study in Paris, which again elevated that to, to the next level of being sort of a world-class artist and to Ex explore things on a broader scale to be in dialogue with a larger community of artists exploring ideas that were maybe beyond what he was getting in Philadelphia. And that was, again, a track that was, was very common for artists to do. That was the, the path. And where he went beyond that, and again, and where he got in Paris, would have been more than enough for him to chew on for a lifetime and produce wonderful work. But then he got a, a, a fellowship to work in Haiti. And that really added so many dimensions to, to the work. And again, while he'd had an interest in the culture and in Africa prior to going to Haiti, which is, I guess, how he ended up there, he really embraced, you know, Haiti's often referred to as the, the only African country in the Western hemisphere. <laughs> and he really embraced the culture there. He worked at the art, the Centro de Art and, and was there for two years involved with the artistic community, but was also involved in a way that really touched his his personal spiritual development and being around that amount of, of uh, African culture was, was important. And you see that it imbues uh, something in the rest of his work that informs how he approaches everything and that, you know, that work immediately after in Haiti that are up now, particularly that, that 1951 piece of dancers really is, it, is pulling the you know, Haitian figures, the Voodoo figures, uh, which recur in, in his work. And we're also, you, have, you see the same thing happen with, with Lois Jones who ended up spending time in Haiti and she uses those same figures of Dambala and other Haitian, fig, Haitian voodoo figures 
to shape her work and to be a source for it. And that time there also saw him transition from being just an artist to really fully being an artist educator who was involved uh, for the rest of his professional or his working career with trying to, to share the craftsmanship that he had worked so hard to develop uh, for himself to share it with others. And I've talked to n numerous uh, people who have studied with him and they all speak about his, his, dra his ability as a draftsman, his ability as a teacher to engage them and push them into um, developing their own voice. And, you know, he was, was able to really find again and again his, his voice, but, it, but he kept singing different songs. And the, the songs were in, you know, the, there was a catalog that was done at, at Brandywine called Serial Images. And that's sort of, he would pose himself a conceptual problem and then he'd do a whole body of work where he's exploring a set of ideas and some of them are very quiet and, and austere like these sky window series which are ju just these almost ethereal skies with a little window in, and some of them are the most densely uh, worked canvases but they're all of a piece, you know, whether he's working on what he calls the Keepers of the Myths and Legends series, which are just superb, or the later collage work, uh, you just see him moving through ideas. And while you, you see a thread that runs through, He's always looking to go beyond. And you know, that, that's the thing. Yeah, he, he was one of those artists who truly believed that the battle for him was in the studio, facing the canvas and trying and trying and trying to get the idea, the image that was inside his head onto the canvas. And almost always failing, but failing with such grace and beauty that his, he was never satisfied, but the work that he produced was enriches all of us who get to see it. Well, speaking of um, his moving through um, many ways of working, um, he is both a figurative and an abstract painter. Would you like to comment on how he moved between the two? Well, that's one of the things I've always admired about Paul. So many painters seem to, as soon as they discover abstraction, either embrace it fully or reject it. And as if you have to make a choice. And there are a relatively small group of artists who are able to, to use what they find but not move away from, from figurative work. Some of his work is fully abstract and is, is I would argue, is on, on a par with anybody doing that type of work, but yet he still <coughs> does these, as you see with Urban Griot that's up now, does these beautiful rendered uh, images that are just compelling and are so clearly drawn both on his North Philadelphia roots, on jazz, on his time in Haiti, and on his time in Paris. Um, here's a clip of him talking about one of his later abstract works with Selma Bortner, a colleague at the Bucks County Community College. This film comes from the BBC, uh, I'm sorry, BCC archives. Well, uh, I've enjoyed working on it, 
I over a year on it and still put in some time. And what I wanted was a way to explain the 911 incident as I saw it in terms of form and color. Usually, I say, there it is, you know, you work it out. Go where you want with it. Maybe I'll get an idea from you. Can you tell us a little bit more about his relationship with music, specifically jazz, and how it influenced his art, Lewis? Well, I know that he, he loved jazz. He had a wonderful collection and listened steadily and was listening frequently in the studio. I think he saw jazz as a, a part of his culture. Again, growing up in Philadelphia, Philadelphia was such a great jazz city with Again, the, the Heath brothers and Coltrane and on and on and was a, a city that had many small jazz clubs at one time, sadly, not so much anymore. But he saw that as part of, of, part of the package that he was choosing to, to represent visually. And in the same way that, that that is part of who we are as Americans is, is, includes that piece of music, he was bringing that same voice to the, to the canvas and bringing that, that visual component. And I think that part of it was that he loved the notion of improvisation because that's what he did as a painter. He went and faced down the canvas, he loved the notion of rhythm because rhythm and pattern were so central to what he did visually. And so I think that there were, there were so many parallels and it was a, a piece of how he thought about himself. For all of his travels, he always thought of himself as a Philadelphia artist. He always made that his starting point and that's the foundation that he, he built on. Great, thank you. Well, Paul King was a frequent artist in residence at the Brandywine Workshop. Between 1980 and 2006, he produced seven prints at Brandywine. And Alan Edmonds, president of Brandywine Workshop and Archives is here to talk about that experience. And you can view these works at the Artura website and also some are available for purchase at the Brandywine store. Alan, what can you tell us about your experience with Paul Keene? First, I'd like to thank Lewis for his very insightful and for me somewhat emotional uh, description of Paul Keene, the person, uh, because in the way that Paul was a role model for you, Lewis, like you say, even despite your ancestry and everything, um, you, you were in that culture uh, but my mom lived in the same community in North Philadelphia that Paul did. And when I told her I was going to art school, she immediately started talking about Paul King and how she knew this young, very talented artist that the community, people in the community were cheering for because they thought he was going to be one of the ones that was going to really be successful, make a name for himself. And luckily for me, I met Paul, uh, in 1971 and I asked him to join the board and he was on one of the original board members of Brandywine Workshop. So he certainly was a role model in many different dimensions to many different aspects of the black community in, in uh, North Philadelphia. So you did an excellent job. Paul would be proud and the family would be very proud of you. Um, my experience with Paul, as I say, started as him becoming a board member, lending his name, his authority, his experience and knowledge to the, the core founding principles and, and thoughtful operation that we would do at Brandywine. Over the years, he did make a, a number of prints with Brandywine and the reason for that was I had a tendency uh, to make sure that the people who were part of the founding of Brandywine um, you know, could, could demonstrate their their talent and, and serve us through their professionalism in the workshop. In the, early, in the early years, we didn't have money to bring people in. We asked people to come in and allow us 
to work with young people in the community to produce their prints, to addition their prints. So in a way, I guess, you know, he was one of the early guinea pigs with Sam Gilliam and John Dow and, and, and Libby Newman and others that worked with us when we had no money and, and had very little equipment. So as time went forward, uh, we, we started out screen printing with Paul. Uh, as you say, uh, Lewis, Paul was very intuitive. He couldn't tell you, oh, this is gonna be a six color print or this is gonna be a 10 color print. We get started, we print some colors, he draws some more, he prints some colors. And it was never really thought out from beginning to end because we might start with a simple line sketch and then we think about the color. You know, we start filling in some shapes and then we start going to the next shapes, the next shape. And it tended sometimes to get quite messy. This print here, the Myth Maker, was, was fairly controlled because it was based upon a line drawing. And then we filled in color and some texture uh, to get the results that you see. And this was one of the earliest ones we did with Paul in 1980. But as time moved forward, we got a little bit messy, which was Paul's intuitive way of work. And this is a great example. This print was about 14, 15 different colors. Uh, we normally don't print that many colors. We try to get uh, uh, sufficient as we can, because again, we, we're dealing with cost and, and time. And, uh, but this was a print that he, 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 he really didn't have a name for. It was really from his Urban Wall series of the 80s and 90s. And what that was about is, is imagining and reflecting on the North Philadelphia community of which he grew up, as Lewis said, his parents were, were fairly middle-class because they owned a funeral parlor and they were you know, considered the leaders within their community. But the community was struggling. North Philadelphia was struggling. Uh, things were changing. And this sense of a final notice that he tagged it with is not necessarily the end, but the beginning, you know, of revitalization and renewal. Because while the, the, the community early on had a lot of culture and a lot of institutions and people were doing salons in their homes and readings and musical uh, presentations, there weren't a lot for the youth. And uh, there was a lot of gang violence. Uh, there was a lot of destruction. And so you get this sense of the peeling away and the generations, you know, moving forward, what's gonna be there for the youth? How are they gonna make it? So he was always storytelling. When you talk about the musician series, you know, yeah. Okay, so you notice this was one of the musician series he's did with us. And you notice that musicians have this halo, this circle around them, because he thought musicians were royalty. You know, they were, they were held up to a very high status within the culture because the musicians um, you know, did bebop, blues, jazz, and they were inventing American music. And uh, Paul took a lot of pride in that and what was going on in his community uh, in all aspects, uh, music, theater, dance. Um, and he took pride in that. So he's representing how lofty um, he placed the, mus the talented musicians that he would illustrate this. Uh, you know, and, and then also it's the idea of people working together, you know, the collaboration, you know, the working together. He, he, he loved that idea. So, so Paul's process was, it wasn't linear. It wasn't start here and go there. It was really, let's start and see where it takes us, you know. And uh, so he also worked uh, with many of the pieces that he did with Brandywine were in the midst of a series he was working on. So the musician series, uh, a couple landscape series he did with us when he was focusing on landscape and he did the window series outside his studio in Bucks County. He did a, a number of paintings, um, graphite drawings and so forth on that. Uh, the Keeper of the Mist series, we did one of those. So we did maybe one or two pieces that represented a series. And Paul was very constant with generating series, having series to work from. And he might have two, two, maybe three series going at the same time, whatever he felt inspired to do. He didn't limit himself. Um, and then I, I wanna end by saying that the process lend itself to a lot of state proofs, a lot of things that necessarily don't get signed, but they show a step in the process. It shows the evolution of the thinking about the image. And we tended Brandywine because printmaking is a multiple, you know, and you're doing additions. 
to keep that material available to the artists in case they choose to take it with them. So on occasion, Paul would like some of the proofs, you know, he would sign the edition, but some of those state proofs he liked. I said, well, Paul, you know, take these, do what you want with them. And he would take them home, he'd paint on them, he collage, and he did so much with the material, the excess material from the printing residency at Brandywine that we invited him to do an exhibition. Uh, I think it was 1976, it was Paul Keene Cyril Images. And it was a combination of drawings, prints, but mostly the collages that he created from the excess material, printed material from the residency. So um, he liked to explore, uh, he didn't mind, right? He didn't mind being messy. You know, some artists like Romare Bearden, um, you may see some of their work printed by other artists, which is very precise. You know, the registration, everything is meticulous. But really Bearden, Paul, and a bunch of artists, they, they were more interested in the expression, the, the idea of seeing the struggle, seeing a hand. Um, and they weren't interested in all that precision. They, they didn't mind getting messy. And it, and it tended to make the work resonate with their painting style. Another artist that is like that is Sam Gilliam, you know, piece behind me. Um, they weren't interested in perfection. They were interested in expression and they wanted the medium to have some evidence, you know. So their collaboration was very respectful uh, to the medium. Uh, it was congenial in terms of the, the master printer that worked with them. It was a give and take. And uh, they just were a delight. Uh, people like Paul were delight to have into the studio. So um, I just wanna say, you know, and emphasize before I conclude is that uh, we do thank the family, as Patty said, very much for their generosity and donating works, uh, really exceptional works by Paul to the auction we have upcoming at Swan Gallery, October 7th. Thank you, Alan. Um, Lewis, back to you. Are you continuing to collect and do you have any advice for folks in our audience who may be thinking about collecting themselves? Well, I, I continue to collect because I don't seem to have any other choice. I, I, it's a disease that I haven't been cured of. Um, and the, the advice is to gather what you love. Uh, you know, people collect for, for many different reasons. I've never been able to find one that made sense other than to, to live with things that enrich my life. And uh, collecting has, has done that for me uh, in, in so many ways, both, both in terms of the objects and the relationships that have come along with, with getting to know artists and uh, gathering, gathering work and seeing, you know, people's, people, the writers say they write to find out what they think Collectors collect to find out what they value. And it, it's been a very rich, rich trip along that way. And uh, again, knowing Paul was just such a, a privilege with that where he allowed me to, to see his process and to see him continue to, to struggle to have that battle back and forth, uh, chasing some elusive phantom, trying to find the the right blend between craft and concept to to make an object that compels us to 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 view it and to be touched by it thank you well for our viewers if you have any questions for lewis um, please post them in the chat section below um, and while you're doing that let's hear a final word from paul before we move on to the questions from the audience. I'm trying to get the people to understand my work. I don't even understand it. But something happens there that, that, that connects with all these outside influences and then you can remind you so many things. It's, it's, it's a way of life. You've got to live it. So thank you again. I enjoy it my end of it. I hope you're the distance in time. Okay, well then, Lewis, Tanner Moore, it's been terrific speaking with you today. Thank you so much for sharing your insights about Paul. And um, we hope that we'll continue to see you 
visiting Brandywine, etc. Thank you. It's been a delight. Great. Thank you. If you'd watch, if you would like to watch the entire video with Paul Keene and Selma Bortner, uh, the one we just showed, and uh, the Senior Artist Initiative uh, and the Mishner Museum film, you can follow the link we have posted here. Um, I would like to thank our viewers. I hope you will join us again for the next Artist in Conversation. And please be sure to visit the website at Brandywine Workshop and archives.org where there are many wonderful things for you to view and learn about. Thank you. <laughs>